Amen. Hope is a very powerful thing. It can make all the difference in a person's life. To have hope is to have strength that you didn't know that you had. To keep going, to keep moving forward. And to lose hope is to lose your way. To lose your footing, maybe even your life. Found a story that demonstrates the power of hope. It's about a, mil a millionaire named Eugene Lang. He was asked to be the speaker to a graduating class of sixth graders at PS 121 in East Harlem. And before he spoke, he talked to the principal a little bit about the kids that he's going to be addressing. And um, he said, he asked how many of the 61 children would go on to go to college. The principal said, probably one. Well, that took him aback, as you can imagine. And he, he knew he wanted to say something that was going to inspire those kids to challenge them not to drop out of school. So he decided to take a very big step. He told them, stay in school and I will help pay for your college tuition. In other words, show me a high school diploma and I will pay for you to attend the college of your choice. Well, at that moment, the lives of these students was changed. They all of a sudden, for the first time, had hope. They had reason to try and to move forward. One of them said, I had something to look forward to, something waiting for me. It was a golden feeling. 90% of that class graduated and went on to college. Well, a clinical psychiatrist named Dale Archer wrote an article for the magazine Psychology Today, and it was called The Power of Hope. He said, if I could find a way to package and dispense hope, I would have a pill more powerful than any antidepressant on the market. Hope is often the only thing between man and the abyss. As long as a patient, individual, or victim has hope, they can recover from anything and everything. Well, with that in mind, I want us to look at Peter this morning. Peter, who was kind of the leader or the spokesperson for the other 11 disciples. He started out as a fisherman, and one day his brother Andrew came to him and he said, we found the Messiah. And he took Peter, Simon, which was his original name, took Simon with him to meet Jesus. And Jesus said to him, you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Peter, which means rock. After they had spent some time together, they had this interesting conversation about who each of them believed the other to be. Peter said to Jesus, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to Peter, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom. That's quite, quite an honor to hear coming from your Lord's mouth. And Peter got a lot of things right, but he also got some really big things wrong. For instance, not long after he made this amazing statement of faith, Jesus had to rebuke him, refusing to believe what he was telling him about his death and resurrection. Peter boldly and wrongly said, this will never happen to you. And Jesus had to rebuke him. He said, get behind me, Satan, you're stumbling block to me. From up here to about down there. And of course, Peter's greatest failure was when those very words came true about the Lord's death and resurrection. On the night before Jesus died, Peter said he would never abandon the Lord, no matter what anybody else did. He would stick by him. He said, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. Yet within a few hours, that's exactly what he did. After Jesus was betrayed by Jew Judas and arrested by the Jewish leaders, Peter denied three different times that he even knew who he was. And in the midst of the confusion of that night and the horror of the next day, which was only made worse by the burden of guilt that he carried because of his denials, the Lord Jesus did die. And Peter wasn't even there with him. He was too afraid to stand with him to the end. <clears throat> to have lost your dearest friend, someone who has just opened your eyes to see the world in a whole new way, who has shown you love, that you could never even begin to imagine was real. To have lost that friend is terrible. But to have parted under such awful terms, he never had a chance to say, I'm sorry, before Jesus died. That such a terrible departure must have been more than he could bear. Of course, there's one other disciple who suffered even more than Peter did that day. It was Judas. It was his betrayal of Jesus that set all of these events in motion. 
And his guilt was more than he could bear. And he, of course, took his own life. But something must have helped pe Peter hang on, hold it together just enough to get through. He, he somehow held his hand from taking such drastic measures. Must, must have been just the smallest fragment of hope, the, the tiniest glimmer of light that kept him from just falling into that dark pit. <clears throat> hope has that effect on people. It gives us the strength to keep on breathing, to, to put one foot after the other, and to keep moving forward day by day. And of course we know that Peter's hope was not in vain because three days later the Lord did rise, just as he said he would. Peter found the empty tomb. But even with the empty tomb in front of him, and hopefully somewhere in his mind, the words of Jesus, he still couldn't quite put it together. It was just, it was too, too much, too, too much to believe. It wasn't until Jesus appeared to him that he began to put all the pieces of the puzzle together. <coughs> and Jesus, in his very great mercy, gave Peter the chance to repent of each one of those denials when they met together on the beach one day. Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me? And Peter had the painful privilege of responding each of those three times, yes, Lord, I do love you. He was reconciled and restored. So it's with this insight into Peter that I want us to look at his first epistle this morning. So find your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. Peter wrote it 30 years after these events. And we can see how his life was totally transformed. How this was the defining moment for him and also, of course, for all of us as well. And over the years, the Holy Spirit gave him insight into the meaning of the resurrection, which we are blessed to have in the scriptures. So 1 Peter chapter 1 is on page what? 1201. 1201. We're going to start at verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Now the first thing I want you to notice here is that Peter is praising God because he has given us a new birth. There are many passages in the Bible that talk about being born again. And when we in faith accept Jesus' death and resurrection as our only means of salvation, not only are our sins forgiven, but we're given a fresh start, a new beginning. I can remember so powerfully and vividly what that felt like that evening in that dorm room Bible study where I sat in the back trying to hide. But after my time of prayer, and when I finally met Jesus for the first time, I felt set. I knew I was getting a new start. I no longer had to hide behind lies and guilt for all the mistakes I made. I was going to get a chance to really live life the way I always wanted to live it. But I never knew I had the strength to do it. And of course, it wasn't my strength. It was his strength that he gave me in the Holy Spirit. Peter goes on to talk about the additional benefits that come with this new birth that we've been given. The first one is hope. He says in verse 3 that we've been giving a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You can say that Jesus' resurrection was the most hopeful event that ever occurred. It means that everything that Jesus said about himself was true. Everything that the cross was supposed to accomplish, it did. It was heaven's resounding amen to everything that Jesus lived and said and died for. This living hope is the assurance that no matter what we face in life, that in Christ we have the promise of a better life to come. We have an eternal future that far outweighs any pain or trouble that we might suffer in this life. It's hard to imagine when you're in the midst of it. But if we were to stretch out a timeline between our time here on this earth and our time in eternity, we know this is just a blip. And no matter how bad it is, what's to come is so much greater. The second benefit of this new life is an inheritance. Verse 4 says, an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, because it's kept for us in heaven. And the word kept here doesn't just mean like it's stuck on a shelf somewhere until you get there, you know, something that's got reserved with your name on it. 
The word that's used here, terio, means guarded, like in the military sense. Think Fort Knox, okay? That kind of guarded. Fort Knox is one of the safest places on earth. You know, it houses $180 billion worth of gold bullion behind a 22-ton door. And the combination to that door is given to 10 different staff members. No one person has the whole combination. The 10 have pieces of it. And in order to open the door, they have to kind of line up and put in their code, their piece of the code in order for it to open. And if that weren't enough to keep the bullion safe, of course, we also know there's armed guards, surveillance, camera, enter, what is that, um, got it written down, infrared surveillance, you know, um, concrete and reinforced granite walls. I mean, it's, like I said, one of the safest places on earth. Whatever is kept in Fort Knox is well kept. So if that's how man guards the nation's wealth, imagine how secure your eternal inheritance is with your heavenly father. Gold in Fort Knox is going to perish one day. It's not going to last for eternity. But the inheritance that we have through faith in Christ will never perish, spoil, or fade. Peter also says that it's not only our inheritance that's kept secure for us, but we are kept secure for it until the day comes for us to claim it. Look at verse 5. It says, shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. We are shielded by God's power. We stand firm and hold fast to our faith in Jesus no matter what's going to happen to us in this life, no matter what. Our souls are eternally secure in Him. And our inheritance includes the rewards that, will, that wait us at the final judgment when we hear, well done, good and faithful servant. We know that we're not going to receive condemnation. We're only going to receive reward at that final judgment because we're coming clothed in Christ's righteousness, not our own. And so that inheritance must include the glory that's going to be ours in our resurrected bodies when we stand before the Father. I mean, we're going to have bodies, but they're going to be glorified in some way. Of course, we all have ideas about how we hope that plays out. But I imagine it's going to be even better than what we imagine. That inheritance includes the fellowship that we're going to have with the angels and all the company of heaven. Everyone in heaven, every, some that we will know and love dearly. We will have fellowship with them once again. And who knows what else? Who knows what else this incurs? In fact, that's the third benefit that, that Peter's talking about this morning, heaven itself. A place where God will wipe away every tear, where there'll be no more sorrow, no more disease, no more pain, no more corruption, no more violence, no more poverty. The list just goes on and on. And I'm just thinking in terms of what won't be there. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 9, no eye has seen, no ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. I can only think about the things that won't be there. We can't even imagine the things that will be there. We probably don't even have words to describe them. Which brings me to the fourth benefit, which is joy. Peter says in verse 6 that because of this great inheritance that we have, we greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. Heaven will be a happy place because it will be perfect. And happiness is dependent upon circumstances. And they will be perfect circumstances for us in heaven. So it will be a happy place. But we're not living in perfect circumstances right now. So happiness kind of comes and goes based on how our day is going. It's, it's, it's not something we can bank on. What we need is joy. Joy is completely independent of your circumstances. It doesn't matter. We can be in the midst of pain or suffering or any kind of trial and still experience joy. Because joy is about the reality of who God is and who we are in Him. Our God is sovereign over every single aspect of His creation and every single aspect of our lives. So when something bad happens to us, we can trust that God is still in control. Not that He has caused us to suffer, but that He is able to take anything that can happen to us and redeem it for His purposes. 
I've met people who have suffered greatly in life, some of them innocently at the hands of others, and I've seen how God has taken their pain and turned it into something just beautiful. Something that has transformed them into people who can give encouragement and strength to others who, are, who have gone through the same thing they've gone through. They're able to share the hope that they found with people who were desperately looking for hope. That's one of the many things that I love about God. And Paul describes it in 2 Corinthians 1.4 as how he comforts us in our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. It's a little bit of a tongue twister, but you can hear what he's saying. When we receive God's comfort, we can then in turn give it to others. Because you can't give away what you don't have. But if you do have it, it's yours to share. Because we're called to be a blessing. I love that God doesn't let, he doesn't waste any pain in our lives. If we'll let him, he can use it for great purposes. We become wounded healers. Verse 7 says, these trials and hardships have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Just as God uses our trials and sufferings to help others, He also uses them to test and to strengthen our own faith. Because faith is kind of like a muscle. It needs to be used and stretched to grow and stay strong. Just like a, a weightlifter will test his strength every now and then by trying to lift heavier weights. The hardships that we face in this life can serve like a test of our faith. We know we passed if we continue to hold on to our trust in God. If we continue to look to Him despite whatever it is we're, we're facing. Look to Him to pre preserve us and to keep us. We remember that He's our anchor in the midst of life. <coughs> Suffering can serve, just like Paul, Peter mentions, can serve like the fire that's used to, to purify gold. The hotter the fire, the more impurities it burns off. And what you have left is 24 karat pure gold. Suffering works that same way in our lives. It burns away any false pretenses about how life is supposed to work, about our own ability to handle things apart from Him. It should drive us to our knees and remind us of the importance of our faith in God above all else. Because that alone is what we will take with us into eternity. Nothing we possess, nothing we've earned, no achievements that we have in this life will last. Only the precious faith that God has given us and which he himself has strengthened and nurtured in our own lives. We saw in the Gospel reading today how Thomas' faith was tested, and it was found strong. He wasn't there when Jesus appeared to the disciples, and so when he heard, it, heard about it, he, it, it sounded too good to be true. But there must have been a little bit of hope there somewhere, because when he did appear to Thomas, Thomas said, my Lord and my God. From doubting Thomas to, to such a bold statement of faith, and Jesus' response was, because you've seen me, you believe. Blessed are they who did not see and yet believe. He's talking about us. We're the ones who haven't yet seen this Lord face to face. Yet we still believe. We've been given a living, living hope through Jesus Christ. And that hope is anchored in the past because Jesus rose from the dead. That hope is anchored in the present because he lives we experience him through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that hope is secure in the future because we have his promise that he will one day come again. And that power of that hope can sustain us through anything that life can throw our way. It tells us that if God has power over death, he has power over anything that we might have to face. We can trust in him. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for this bedrock of hope that we have in you. And what I pray for is the grace to remember that when the storm does hit. When someone we love gets sick, or if it's us ourselves. When anything bad happens in our way, Lord, give us the grace to remember that we are anchored in you, and that our feet are standing upon the solid rock that is the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And when someone around us is, is suffering in the midst of that storm, Lord, help us to stand with them. Help us to help them find their footing and find their hope. In Jesus' name we pray.